So while there are plenty of movies that might require an introduction, this isn't one of them. In fact, if I were to create a list of my all-time favorite movies, this would not only be on it, but it would make it pretty close to the top. Now that said, I still have some questions, so let's talk it out. Now first things first, let's introduce our main characters. Now this is Marty McFly, your average 17-year-old high schooler. A few key people in his life are his girlfriend Jennifer, mom Lorraine, dad George, sister Velma, and his brother Dave. Next we have Dr. Emmett Brown, Marty's... friend? Look, I know a few years back Bob Gale basically retconned how they met, but since that was 26 years after they released the movie, it felt like he finally just came up with something to settle the debate. Anyway, Marty just calls him Doc, so that's good enough for me. So Back to the Future opens up in a room with a lot of clocks. Like, way too many of them. Hey, Doc! Now Marty shows up, he blows up an impossibly large amp, I can roll. and then gets a call from Doc asking him to meet at the mall later that night. <laughs> the clocks then go off indicating it's 8 a.m., but after Doc explains they're all 25 minutes slow, Marty realizes he's late for school, even though he's only been there like three minutes, so he was already late for school. Well, we finally make it to school, and he gets detention for being late. You're a slacker. Gets shot down by Huey Lewis for being too loud, and later heads into town with Jennifer. Save the clock tower! Okay, calm down there. If you want money, be polite. Don't just sneak up on them and shake a can an inch from their face. Anyway, after Ms. Exposition fills us all in with a history of the clock tower and hands Marty a plot device, I mean, flyer, he heads home to find out the family car he was hoping to borrow that weekend had been in a wreck after George lent it to his boss, Biff, who didn't realize there was an apparent blind spot. I spilled beer all over when that car smashed into me. And that. Well, after dinner that night, George helps himself to a massive bowl of peanut brittle, and Lorraine gives us a bit more exposition under the guise of a story I'm sure these kids have heard far too many times. What was it, George? Bird watching? What, Lorraine? What? <laughs> it's been 30 years, and you're still sticking with that story? Your father kissed me for the very first time on that dance floor, and it was then that I realized that I was going to spend the rest of my life with him. Now, Doc will later attribute this as the Florence Nightingale effect, but given her popularity in school and George's... Well, let's just say he was probably considered a loser by the losers. You really expect him to believe she felt so bad about what her dad did that she'd even consider going to the dance with him? Well, later that night, Marty heads to the mall where Doc decides to make a spectacular entrance with the DeLorean. But let's think about this. For this to work, Doc would have needed to get in the car, pull into the van, close the door remotely, fill the space with fog while still in the car since he wouldn't be able to open those doors, and then just wait. I, mean, I guess Doc just likes to make an entrance, but he also seems genuinely surprised to see Marty there. So Doc explains he built a time machine out of the DeLorean, and as a test, he's going to send his dog Einstein precisely one minute into the future. Now he gets the DeLorean up to... 88 miles per hour! In an impossible amount of time, sets Marty's foot on fire without him even noticing, and one minute and 15 seconds later, Einstein reappears and shows their clocks are exactly one minute apart. Yeah, I'm not sure how that works either. Now, in order to power the machine, Doc had stolen a bit of plutonium from some Libyan nationalists. But since Doc would of course be at the mall at 1.16 in the morning, they track him down, kill him, and try to chase down Marty. See if you bastards can do 90. Now, without even thinking about it, he gets himself up to... 88 miles per hour! And crashes into a barn owned by some farmers who are convinced he's an alien since their kid has a comic book that just happens to have a spaceship with gullwing doors and an alien in what appears to be a radiation suit. Well, he escapes, again, and makes his way into town where he looks up Doc in the phone book. Great, you're alive. Now after sitting down to a cup of... Something without any sugar in it, okay? He bumps into his dad and just stares at him. What? Now, understandably, this scares George away, so Marty goes into full stalker mode and tracks him down while George is bird watching. He's a peeping Tom. Now, he falls from the tree, but just as he's about to get hit by a car, Marty saves him and gets hit and knocked out. When he comes to, he realizes who's in the room with him, and like any reasonable person would do, he panics. But you're, uh, you're so, uh, you're so uh, thin. Quick, put your pants back on. Hold up. So I'm guessing her dad is the one that carried him upstairs, but Lorraine must have taken it upon herself to take off his pants. Well, he's invited to stay for dinner, but after this, he decides it's time to leave and heads over to Doc's. Now, after going all Professor Marvel on Marty, Come here from a great distance. You're traveling in disguise. You want me to buy a subscription to the Saturday Evening Post? You're, uh, you're going on a visit. He convinces Doc of who he is by explaining how he hurt his head and came up with the idea of the flux capacitor. Now they head out to where the car is stashed, somehow sneak it back, and after reviewing the camcorder footage, Doc realizes there's a problem in a manner only Christopher Lloyd could deliver. 0.21 gigawatts! 
Now, since plutonium is a bit hard to come by in 1955, they'll instead need a bolt of lightning. And thanks to the plot device, Flyer, they know exactly when it'll strike, right down to the minute, which honestly doesn't seem precise enough for what they need to do. And since Marty will need to spend some time in 1955 before the storm hits, Doc wants to make sure he doesn't do anything to change the future. But of course, Marty already screwed that up. This proves my theory. Look at your brother. His head's gone. It's like it's like he's been erased. Yeah, I'm going to come back to that photo later. Now, realizing what he's done, they head to school the next day. You're a slacker. And try to get them back together by getting George to ask her to the dance. I don't know if I could take that kind of a rejection. Now, since George won't risk getting rejected, Marty tries a different approach. My name is Darth Vader. I am an extraterrestrial from the planet Vulcan. And the next day, George is ready to go. Give me a milk. Chocolate. Fast forward a bit, George fails miserably. My density has brought me to you. Marty picks a fight with Biff, and after being chased through town, Biff crashes into a manure truck. Now, since nothing has gone to plan yet, Lorraine tracks Marty down and asks him to the dance, or asks him to ask this. But I was kind of wondering if, if you'd ask me to the enchantment under the sea dance on Saturday. Now reluctantly he agrees, but hatches a new plan. Okay, so right around 9 o'clock, she's going to get very angry with me. Because, George, nice girls get angry when uh, guys take advantage of them. <laughs> Even the kind of girl that'll take off your pants while you're unconscious? Well, they get to the dance. Marty kisses his mom, and since George is running late, Biff finds them instead. Marty is then yanked out of the car and thrown into the trunk of the band's car. Meanwhile, Biff climbs in with Lorraine, and George finally arrives. Now, having had enough, George finally stands up to Biff and then takes Lorraine into the dance. Now, as this has been happening, Marty is finally freed from the car, but in the process, the guitarist hurts his hand. And since it's vital that they kiss while dancing, Marty takes his place. All right, fine, let's talk about this photo. Now, ever since he saved George from being hit by Lorraine's dad, the McFlies have slowly been disappearing from this photo, with Marty now the only one remaining. Now, how could the possibility of George and Lorraine not getting together cause individual people to slowly fade from this photo, instead of the entire thing fading from existence? Not only that, but spoiler alert, we later find out that because George got a boost of confidence from this night, that their entire lives turned out differently. But this photo was still taken exactly the same way? Now, after an interesting rendition of Johnny Be Good, he leaves the stage and bumps into his parents. Marty, such a nice name. So naturally, they named her firstborn Dave? Dave! 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 Dave. Ah. And with the success of getting his parents back together, Marty catches up with Doc to prepare to head back to the... head forward? He prepares to head to 1985, but first tries to tell Doc about getting shot in the future. It's about the future, isn't it? Now, unfortunately, Doc won't listen, but Marty has an idea. I got all the time I want. I got a time machine. I can just go back early and warn him. There we go. Ten minutes ought to do it. Ten minutes? What are you going to do with ten minutes? Go back a few hours or a day or two. Give him some time to figure out a plan. Well, Doc has to deal with a couple more issues. <laughs> And after being slightly electrocuted, Marty disappears. Now he takes a look around to make sure it all worked, and as he heads off to the mall, the car dies. Again. And just as this happens, the Libyans pass, and this is why you give yourself extra time. But well, fortunately, Doc actually read the letter and took some precautions. Well, I figured. What the hell? So Doc drops Marty off at his house, tells him he's headed 30 years into the future, and takes off. Marty then sneaks in, falls asleep, and wakes to find the house has been completely transformed. And just so I understand, George, now a successful author, still bought the same house in the same neighborhood? Dave's still living at home? And since Lorraine asked that the trip is still on, Marty's life still panned out the same way to not only still date Jennifer, but to still have planned this trip for the exact same weekend? If it wasn't for him, we never would have fallen in love. Like I've always told you, you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. Oh! Marty! Marty, here's your keys. You're all waxed up, ready for tonight. So many questions. Alright, first of all, I just can't understand how Biff is such a pushover now. Why? Because George punched him out 30 years ago? That's just not how it works. Sure, maybe Biff would have decided to leave George alone, but in all likelihood, Biff would have just been even more pissed off and would have eventually gotten George back for it. Second, are you giving credit to Biff for the two of you falling in love? Biff? The guy that sexually assaulted you the night of the dance? Really? Third, not only do you remember the phrase so well, but you seem to live by it too. Surely you must remember who said it to you, right? You don't find it strange your son looks exactly like this guy? The guy that actually set you and Lorraine up? The guy who, the first day you met him, was wearing the exact same outfit as Marty? Really? Nothing? And don't give me the whole it's been 30 years nonsense. I'm 40 and I can clearly remember moments from when I was 10. Surely something as big as the week leading up to this dance would still be in there. <sighs> Alright, 
So Marty heads to the garage to find the truck he wanted so badly at the beginning of the movie is now parked diagonally in the garage. Because it's not enough that he has his dream truck, but he, a 17-year-old student, also gets the garage all to himself. Well, Jennifer shows up, they chat, and just as they go in for a kiss, they get Doc blocked. You've got to come back with me! It's your kids, Marty! Something has got to be done about your kids! So you go 30 years into the future, find out their kid gets into trouble, and now want Marty and Jennifer to go to the future to fix it? Look, that's just cruel. Just let them know what'll happen so they can worry about it then. Give them a letter they shouldn't open until a specific date even. Don't make them fix it only to send them back to 1985 so they have to do it all again in 30 years. That's it for part one. I know it seems a bit a bit hard on this one, but honestly, Back to the Future really is one of my all-time favorite movies. But that's it for this one. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you want to see more, and as always, bye for now.